All right, Chris here. This is the first episode of the new decade, so Happy New Year to all of you. I have some very interesting guests lined up already, and I'm excited to see what new mind-bending conversations this year will bring. My hope is that I can grow the podcast significantly over the next 6 to 12 months, so please take the time to tell your friends about it if you're enjoying it, and help me spread the news. Writing a five-star review on iTunes would also be a great Christmas gift, which I'll reluctantly forgive you for not giving to me already on the 25th. In this episode, I speak with Sam, who goes by CritRat, at Crit underscore Rat on Twitter. He's a DPhil student in physics at the University of Oxford and researches foundational issues in quantum theory. Besides that, he's also very interested in the philosophy of science, as his Twitter handle subtly suggests. You can find a link to his website where he writes on these topics on Twitter as well. We spend the next hour or so talking about a smorgasbord of fascinating topics like determinism and causality, the supposed role of consciousness in quantum physics, evolutionary psychology, meme theory, and more. Sam is a very cool chap with lots of interesting ideas, so enough chit-chat. I hereby welcome the Crit Rat himself. All right, so I'm live with Sam Kuypers. How are you doing today, Sam? Doing very well, thanks. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. It's uh, great to have you on the podcast. Yeah, it's great to be on the podcast. As I said before we started recording, it's great that we now have uh, a couple of podcasts within the critical rationalist subculture to discuss ideas, to kind of talk to one another uh, through a nice medium. And also, the podcasts you've recorded, especially the ones with Charlie, are so effortlessly funny that I'm very happy that you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's very heartwarming to hear. And like I also told you before we started recording, I started the podcast with the sole purpose of getting to talk to people like you, to have an excuse to reach out to you. So um, this is awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. All right, before we dig into all the juicy stuff, I thought we could figure out the dynamic here. So would it be fair to say that you are the Sam to my Frodo in this conversation? And this episode will kind of be our attempt at destroying the metaphorical ring, so to speak. Yes, and whenever I get tired, you will tell me that you cannot carry the ring for me, but you can carry me. So I'll let you carry the majority of this conversation for that reason. Oh, shit. That's not what yeah. I had planned at all, but all right, man. I just want to also shout out to uh, Charlie, Hermes Cerise, and he would definitely get to be Gollum in this scenario. We got you, Charles. Yes. It's all good. <laughs> These are not my words, but yeah. Now when we've appropriately set the stage here, I thought we could start uh, with your professional area of interest here, so physics. And... I'd like to start with the concepts of determinism and causality. I've played ignorance before when it comes to physics, so I'll, I'll kindly ask you to dumb it down for me here as much as possible. But these are concepts that are, are often invoked to make moral arguments on the grounds that nothing ultimately matters because everything is already determined. That is, whatever happens is already dictated by the, the initial states of the universe and a loss of motion. So... Why should we bother doing anything? And then they're also used as an argument for reductionism to claim that yes. it doesn't make any sense at all to talk about emergent phenomena such as people, choices, preferences. In fact, I, I heard Brett Weinstein argue this in a recent podcast episode with Sam Harris where he claimed something like if the universe in fact is deterministic, which he didn't believe... It makes no sense to even have this conversation, to talk about natural selection, love, doing science, etc. None of that would make any sense, because it's basically all just predetermined atoms clashing in the void uh, by the laws of physics, what they dictate. And this seems extremely misguided to me in many ways. So I'd like to ask you then, what, what is determinism and how 
should one think about it in relation to all these aforementioned arguments? So determinism is the view that whatever happens will by necessity happen because of the fundamental laws of physics. So mm. within, say, particle physics, with, there are a set of equations that are deemed fundamental. They have, uh, they're called equations of motion, and given the right initial conditions, they will predict what will happen to the system at any later time. Right. Now, one of the reasons why this worldview is not helpful whenever you're dealing with, say, questions of morality is that uh, let's suppose that, you know, you come to me, as you often do, with a moral question and um, <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to help you out. And, uh, and then I say things like, well, I'm a physicist and you should just do whatever the laws of physics have predetermined that you will do. Then uh, I think that that's the reason why you stopped asking me these questions, because it's, it's a very unhelpful answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't really learn anything from that explanation because uh, surely you were already going to do that and you don't have access to that anyway and what am I even saying so regardless of what happens to these fundamental equations we for example want answers to moral predicaments like what should I do when I have hurt the feelings of my spouse say or yeah something of that kind does not have a neat explanation in terms of simply saying or simply alluding to what happens to fundamental particles. This view is weird in another way because whenever you invoke the equations of motion, um, the so-called initial conditions don't need to be initial at all. They could be conditions that they could be the conditions of the universe at this moment. And from those, it would follow what happened at any previous time and at any future time as well. So within this framework of initial conditions and equations of motion, it's difficult to make sense of causality, because we wouldn't say that the initial conditions actually cause the past to happen mm. when the initial conditions are right now. So causality is itself, I think, an emergent phenomena. When we say that something happened for a particular reason and we give a causal explanation, then we're already doing something extra than simply using the equations of motion or simply using them. So I think that, say, uh, if we're talking about free will or morality, then of course we have to find an explanation that is compatible with, with the fundamental uh, equations of motion, and yet it will be an emergent thing, I think. It will be explanation for what free will is, for what morality is, will be emergent and uh, like causality itself completely compatible with the fundamental equations of motions and con initial conditions. Just to reiterate and see if I understand you correctly here. So you're saying that the idea that we can start at the initial state and then just predict what's going to happen in the future uh, through the loss of motion we can also do that backwards, which is why it's hard to talk about causality, because the future states also constrain the previous states. Is that right? Yes. I think people have a tendency to say that when you give an initial condition, then all future times follow, and that is what causality actually is. That causality is something that emerges from the initial conditions and then the equations in motion. You, you start a clockwork, and then it, it just everything just falls and it's one directional yes. pretty much. I like the, expl the the argument from explanation that if I want moral advice, which you correctly said that I come to you for, which I do all the time, every time I get the same fucking, yeah, loss of motion bullshit. So I don't know why I keep doing it, Sam. I don't know why I'm yeah. not learning, but I guess it's determined, right? I can't do anything about it. No, yes, so There's actually a very good book about why you should only take seriously good explanations. Uh, maybe you should read it. It's uh, Maybe you'll stop coming to me for advice because I only have this one thing that I can say. Oh, it's by this uh, Dave Ditch or something he's called. D D Ditch something, yeah. But so, okay, if it's determined to happen, it'll happen. Th this is what I'm curious about, Dan. Does it really make sense to invoke the loss of motion in initial conditions when you talk about 
let's say right now I'm sitting here, I'm trying carefully to choose what to say, right? Or at least that's my way of explaining it. People seem to easily fall into this nihilistic, oh, but there's no need for me to choose because there is no choice because it's all particles in the void, like I said before. Is, does that make metaphysical sense? Yeah, I, I don't think it does. I think even people like Sam Harris don't think that that makes sense. They would say that choices are real and yet that they are completely predetermined. To the extent that he thinks choices are real, I agree with them and I think that we have free will. Like people have the ability to have problems and to conjecture explanations to those problems. And if they don't want to participate in that conjecturing phase, then they won't solve their issues. And, and I think we agree on this. I think that Sam Harris would say, yeah, of course, they, they if they have this view that whatever is going to happen will happen, then they might lie on the couch and do nothing. Yeah, but that sounds like a tautology to me. Like I've always thought that determinism invoked in this sense just sounds like, and causality, just sounds like another version of, yeah, whatever happens is going to happen, like you said. But that doesn't give us any information at all. Of course, that's obvious. Yes. If you have to give an explanation of why a particular problem did get solved, uh, then the causal explanation will be someone was interested in that problem, say, and... Uh, they found a solution through conjecturing. It, it won't be, oh, they did what the laws of physics told them to do again. Th that will not be the explanation for why someone solves the problem. Right. So the explanation of why, say, progress happens, why people do things, why problems get solved, will never be just the equations of motion. And I think if you grant that, then you still have a causal explanation uh, it might be deterministic, and at the same time, it's a higher order. It, it's emergent. The, this idea of conjecturing does not appear anywhere within fundamental physics, and yet it is the explanation for why people do things. Yeah, and this ties in neatly to my favorite way uh, of arguing against that perspective, which is that I, I feel like many people uh, who adopt a reductionist worldview think that what happens at the lowest level somehow happens first. Like something happens at the atom level and then you make choices. Like then you move or you do. To me, that's ridiculous. To me, it's it's the same with the neuroreductionism that I often hear from people like Sam Harris or, or, or um, similar popularizers, popularizers of these ideas is that, yeah, the, the neurons fire and then I make a choice or then I do something. But it's all, we're explaining the same phenomenon on different levels of explanation. To me, making a choice is the same thing as invoking something at the neural level or at the atom level. Obviously, all of those things are happening at the same time. I don't see why it starts at the bottom and then everything else just falls on top of that. Does that make any sense? Yeah, uh, it makes complete sense. It, it reminds me of this passage from the beginning of infinity where um, David writes a, writes about a cork on a champagne bottle. Mm. And he says that there are very simple equations determining what happens to the cork, but in certain circumstances, it is highly unpredictable what will happen to it. it, it in cases where the champagne will be opened whenever uh, some scientists find a new planet, then you can't just simply deduce from fundamental physics when the cork will be removed. You require something extra. Mm. You require these like emergent explanations that invoke people and discoveries. Yeah. To be really technical then, is it the case that the universe as we know it is fully deterministic, and does that entail fatalism as well? The idea that not only are the initial conditions and everything leading up to this moment what has determined me, but everything that is going to happen in the future is also already written in some sense. Yeah, I don't think it implies fatalism. For one thing, the future is highly unknowable. So let's say that you want to know what a person is going to do and you decide that you make a simulation of him, 
then you could claim, oh, I've now simulated my subject and I thus know what he is going to do in the future, which is maybe something like discover a new scientific theory. Then that is still not really predicting what will happen because your subject simply has been copied into your computer. He, he is functioning within a simulated world, but it is him in a real sense. And that's one way of showing that the future is not simply deducible from the laws of physics. You need, uh, I, I keep reiterating this, but you need explanations of what people do. And those are very hard to come by. And you can't simply, uh, say, simulate the future of humanity uh, or even propose an explanation for what happens to the future of humanity. That th Those will be highly unreliable because people are novel. They, they create new theories of the world and those allow them to manipulate the universe around them in very extreme and interesting ways. So we have no access to this history of the future of the universe. And that is one reason why we should remain optimistic. We don't know what's going to happen. Even if it is predetermined, we don't know what's going to happen. And an attitude of fatalism will surely only make things worse. Hence, I, I think fatalism doesn't work as, a, as an explanation for what we what our attitude should be towards the future would that entail what you just said there the unpredictability of knowledge would that mean that even if we had laplace's demon the the complete information of everything that we still couldn't even at the atom level predict what was gonna happen uh no i don't think so the the laplace's demon is actually impossible in several ways. I think one of them is that if you have a computer that can simulate the whole of the universe, then it also should be able to simulate itself because it should be an important actor in the universe. And thus, its memory capacity should be so large that it contains a copy of itself and therefore it has to be infinite and cannot be realized in the physical world. So even if you have a very precise computer you could never simulate the whole of the universe. And uh, it is, of course, perfectly fine or perfectly possible to simulate small systems, but you get into trouble when you try to do this on, not just on, not even on large scales. I mean, we, there are large scale objects like stars that behave very regularly and that we can predict what will happen to, to high accuracy. But there are certain novel objects like people that will get you into trouble when you try to predict what will happen to them. Right. But so is that then impossible in principle, or is it just a matter of us not having enough knowledge to do so? Yeah, I would say it's impossible in principle. Uh, both the realization of the Laplace's demon is impossible in principle because it would uh, require an infinite memory capacity, but also predicting the future growth of knowledge is impossible. Mm. As Popper said, it's impossible in principle to predict the future growth of knowledge knowledge because when you do so so let's say you predict what people will think tomorrow then in fact or predict what people will discover tomorrow about science then you have made that discovery today and you have not learned uh, anything about what will happen tomorrow yeah so in this sense in the sense that new th new things can exist it is impossible to predict what they will be. So let's move on a little bit to quantum theory, which I thought we could start from the angle of uh, there being a lot of myths and misinformation going around when it comes to it, which certain people, it's often in, in, in mystical terms, uh, capitalize on quantum theory to bolster their nonsense. And the main example that comes to my mind here is the so-called law of attraction uh, when they make claims like and i'm quoting here from the law of attraction resource guide online quote quantum physics takes a spiritual perspective in which there are no separate parts in which everything is fluid and always changing the physical world is a sea of energy constantly flashing into and out of existence it is through our thoughts that we transform this ever-changing energy with a capital e into observable reality 
Therefore, we can create our reality with our thoughts. Uh, end quote. Now, clearly, this is all true. Since I visualized you comment on my podcast today, <laughs> and here we are. But yeah, if we ignore that for a moment, I, I'd like you to tell us what's wrong with this fairly common idea of how it is the conscious observer that ultimately shapes reality. Yes. But by the way, was that quote real? Is that something that's actually on the internet and it, it's an actual resource for people who are interested in the law of attraction? It's very real. And it's under the, the uh, URL of resource. Yes. So that's, uh, that's infuriating in very many ways. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't actually know what was being said. Uh, that, that's, <laughs> I have no idea what, what any of that meant. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure that's my flaw. And in fact, I haven't paid attention enough in school to understand the deep physics that went into that. I think that might be the case, yeah. But the observer effect, I think, is something that's actually a real phenomenon in quantum physics. And that's often misinterpreted as conscious observers shape reality. And and we've proven this with quantum physics. Yes, so I actually think that this is a case where uh, physicists have helped along people who want to abuse physics for their own ends. Because there is this explanation of quantum theory known as the Copenhagen interpretation, also known as collapse theory, which states that whenever a conscious observer interacts or observes a quantum system, they make the quantum system collapse into a particular state. And that uh, it is their consciousness that makes this happen. That is a variant of collapse theory. I think the most mainstream one. Right. And it's very disheartening that this happened because, I mean, the thing that you just wrote down or that you just read is, I think, to a large extent, inspired by this kind of an idea that fundamental physics tells us that consciousness is uh, not just important, but important in a spooky way that it, we can we can make the world what it is by thinking about it, that we have some kind of strange interaction with systems that uh, even physicists are baffled by. All of these things could have been prevented if people just adopted the ever interpretation of quantum theory immediately. Of course, that's not what happened, but this is one of the reasons why you, you can find things like this on the internet that you just read. Right. So what is the fundamental flaw with it then? Why, what is it that's happening when people are talking about observer and observer effect? I think there's a couple of variants of this. One of them is just a very standard classical example of if you, whenever you interact with a system, you in fact have to perturb it in some way. And therefore, it is a slightly different system. Uh, say if you have to measure the, the air pressure in a wheel, then you interact with the wheel and slightly change the pressure with an apparatus to see what the pressure is. Right. And uh, there's another version of this in quantum theory, which is more subtle, but is in fact a mechanical thing, just like measuring the air pressure in a wheel is, uh, where you can interact with the quantum system and because of the fact that quantum systems have an outcome that isn't predetermined, it appears as though you are changing the outcome. Whereas in fact, you are seeing one of several outcomes that happen across the multiverse, across uh, the, the other universes, which I imagine now sounds to people like that should be the crazy thing. But in fact, I think that this is just the only way to take quantum theory seriously and and it gets rid of this idea that consciousness plays a special role within physics i mean consciousness might still be and probably is very important to the universe uh, but just not in this this kind of mystical way yeah it's not that quantum physics tells us that uh, consciousness is this thing that can shape reality yeah which is an important distinction to make an example came to mind another uh, atrocious example came to mind where I emailed certain somatic therapists to, to find a good therapist here in Gothenburg that I wanted to try. And I asked about uh, their process um, 
of, of therapy, how it looked like. And I got a response from a, a person who would remain unnamed. He's a quite famous therapist in Sweden, actually. And he also said, let's see, it's in Swedish. I'll try to translate here. But he said that when two functions in nature has a common point of entry, there's something called an entanglement that's created. Uh, for example, <laughs> two parts of a split photon interact with each other independent of time and space. And they, what? And the two parts of a cell that has split interacts with each other. And then he invokes new research has found that photons are radiating from the skin of humans, science says, pretty much. I have no idea what he said, but I immediately deleted his email and uh, cried for a bit, actually. Oh, no. By the way, I mean, the idea that skin emits photons, this is saying (laughs) bodies that are hot can emit light, which is quite an everyday phenomenon. Right. I mean, whenever you look at the sun, then indeed the sun emits light because it's hot. So <laughs> he got something right and, and, and had to mystify it, which is kind of funny. He did. and But that's what I think, uh, that's what makes my blood boil is when people, even, even something like neuroscience, which tends to have this weight to it. So when someone says, oh, new research shows the neurocorrelate of uh, shopping for carrots or whatever – and that is <laughs> that for some reason that makes it important, uh, even though everything has a neurocorrelate. It's just it's nonsense. It doesn't tell us anything. All right. So let's switch it up a bit and go into evolutionary psychology instead, which basically is the idea that much like our bodies and our organs have evolved for specific functions, our minds, too, are best described as consisting of these specific adaptations or modules, they're often called, that have been shaped by natural selection to solve our problems of of survival and reproduction. I don't know why that's a hard word for me today. And on the face of it, this seems rather plausible. Uh, We are, after all, evolved creatures, but I'd like you to maybe state it more concisely than I did just now, but also then explain to us why it doesn't make sense to talk about the mind in this way. Yeah, so I, I think you gave a perfectly fine description of what evolutionary, evolutionary psychology is, which is the idea that genes determine our minds, specifically our psychology, our psychological makeup. Mm. And I, I think this explanation feels for the same reason that the explanation that we don't have free will feels. So... Uh, for, for the sake of argument, let's suppose that this is true, that people have traits that uh, are inborn, not just physical traits, but also certain mental traits, maybe a habit, maybe uh, a part of your psychology that is determined by your genes. Mm. Like, say, you have to interrupt people while talking. And I have that gene. Yes, very nice. Okay, so let's suppose that you have this gene and um, now you're faced with a problem, namely you want to make a podcast, and also it's very difficult to make a podcast while you have to in- while you interrupt people. So what happens then is that you, if you're aware that this is a problem, then you'll try to solve it. You'll start conjecturing better ways of behaving during recordings, mm. and because problems are soluble there will be some solution available, either uh, technological uh, or just by mentally changing what your trait is, which I think is completely possible and happens uh, all the time. So say uh, people don't like pain, uh, they have an inborn trait of trying to avoid pain, and yet people go to the gym and they work out heavily to the extent that they get their muscles need to recover. And they... Uh, are in pain both during and after the workout. Or people have a fear of heights, and yet they enjoy the fear of heights, and they exploit it when they uh, jump out of an airplane with a parachute. So those are inborn traits that have been adjusted by people's ability to explain the world, to make better guesses for how to behave. But so you're not so opposed... Even if like, that's that gene again. So you're yes. not opposed to the idea that we have we we might have some 
psychological predispositions like the aversion to heights or pain that you just mentioned now, but they are just very secondary and they're malleable. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think that is the case. And I think by the time that we're, we're older, many of these inborn traits have been altered. Even if they weren't, then we could still engage with them uh, through our problem-solving mechanism. So they are not a very important fact of our psychology, I think. Uh, it, it's perfectly fine that we... Like, I think it's very important that we acknowledge that we do have inborn ideas, and it's those that we use to discover our problems, our first problems, and those are the ideas that we subsequently alter. Um, so we aren't blank slates, but this ability to alter our mental makeup is, in the end, I think, more important than the fact that we have these inborn ideas. Right. So I, I'd love for you to give an example of some inborn ideas. But before that, I just want to say that, okay, so the claim of evolutionary psychology then is that the entirety of our mind can be explained by these genetic predispositions rather than just the starting point of certain traits that we can then alter. I don't actually know. I think that might be a hardcore version of evolutionary psychology. I can also imagine that there's people who say, okay, well, there's very specific traits, say your, your sexuality, that uh, cannot be altered. And there are, and that they would acknowledge that there are things that you can change, that there is a set of things, there's a set of your psychology that you cannot alter. Okay, so the, but the claim is still fairly strong in that most of our behavior is best explained by these things that are set in stone and that we can't change. Yes, I think so. Uh, I, th I think the, the more important explanation of our behavior is memes, is meme theory. Yes, and, and that's something... And the I reason is... Ah, <laughs> we, we've gotten into the habit of this now. I think we both have a gene that is expressing itself. I, I am setting up interruptions for you and yes. you're knocking them down you're, i'm yes. just smashing the shit out of them yeah and yeah. i i uh i actually want to go into meme theory very soon here but i want to harp on this point a little more before so sex differences let's get down and dirty with something that's very uncontroversial right so i took an entire class in evolutionary psychology and this was a little over a year ago, I think, when I hadn't found the Deutschian framework yet. So I was, um, uh, I was more on the side of sex differences being best attributed to the differences in physiology, right? So you're not disputing that there might be slight variations of these predispositions we talked about between male and females, uh, because of our, our difference in bio biological makeup, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, but you are saying that that is secondary and, and deemed almost irrelevant because we are universal and we have a mind that can change these inborn theories and interpretations. Yes, I, I think... The thing that evolutionary psychology is, in a sense, trying to defend are, for example, the sex differences that they see between men and women. They, yeah. uh, I think their problem situation is such that they think these differences are fundamental or, in some sense, important. And so they want to give a defense of them in terms of uh, something fundamental like genes, which would work perfectly well if, if people were just normal animals uh, without uh, any ability to explain the world. But because we can explain the world, because of our universality, the, that explanation, I think, has to fail. And yet, at the same time, I agree that there are important traditions, as I would call them, that, say, distinguish the sexes. So you don't necessarily have to say that the sex differences are changeable and therefore uh, completely arbitrary. That's not what I think uh, my case is. 
All right, folks, time for the fun stuff. So if you really enjoy what I'm doing here, there is a way to support the podcast. You can go over to ko-fi.com slash do explain. That is ko-fi.com slash do explain. And you can make a one-time donation or even a monthly donation if that's the kind of person you feel like being this year. Maybe you should ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And then surely Jesus would donate to do explain. Another way you can help me out is to go over to iTunes and write me a five-star review. That would also be very helpful. All right. Thank you very much. Let's get back to enjoying the show. Let's go over to how our minds actually seem to work instead then. And that is something that's tied to memes and something called meme theory. Now, I've discussed memes here and there with other guests, but I would love if you could give us an overview here. So what is meme theory and why is it important in this context? So meme theory was basically introduced by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, where he also introduced the idea of a replicator, an entity that can cause itself to be copied. And he discovered that it's not just genes that have this property, but ideas can also be what he calls replicators. So there are ideas that can cause themselves to be reliably copied by other people. And I think... the way in which we have to explain human psychology is in terms of genes. Uh, One of the reasons I think this is that the rate of change of genes compared to the rate of change in memes is much slower. So uh, whenever genes and memes are competing for a uh, personality trait, say, then uh, the memes will always outcompete the genes. And as soon as they've done so, Uh, they will render the gene for that personality expression useless. And the reason for this difference in speed is that genes only change on the timescale of uh, lifespans, whereas memes can be altered within within a lifespan. Right. We can alter and improve memes several times over within a lifespan. And so I think that because of this, the way we have to explain human psychology is is mainly in terms of the memes that uh, are within our culture. So the, the, yeah, okay. So selection pressure on certain traits that has previously been dictated by our genetic makeups and by specific genes are going over to mimetic selection. And the selection pressure is now on the memes rather than certain genes for certain traits. Yes. So what about something specific? Because I I ended up in an argument with Charlie about this yesterday, actually, or Gollum, whatever we want to call him. And he (laughs) he said that uh, your words, not mine, Sam, but he he said that um, (laughs) we were talking about uh, sexual drive and he thought that that was completely mimetically driven at this point, like horniness or, you know, the urge to mate. And I was pushing back on that. Um, What is your intuition there? Um, I don't actually know. I think that this could be a case where memes hijacked a biological trait. And yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to explain this purely in terms of what the memes do. So horniness or, uh, I'm thinking if there's a if, if there's a better word that isn't disgusting. Sex um, drive. <laughs> sex sex drive is a good one. I was thinking yeah. of sexual arousal, which sounds even worse than horny. <laughs> yeah. uh, it sounds way worse. Yeah, so uh, let, let's say sex drive is uh, a biological trait. It, it is it's physiological, uh, but it also has a mental component. There, the memes can hijack the physiological response. So. There will be cultural differences for what people find uh, sexy, say. Yes. And that, yeah, that's my take on this issue. There is almost certainly a physiological component, but how that uh, physiology is enacted, how that behavior that uh, is associated to the physiology is, is enacted, is determined by the memes, not by the genes. 
Yes, but the predisposition, so the biological urge is still there to begin with. Yes, and people can alter it. Yeah, surely, surely. But but yeah, because th this is what we argued about yesterday. And, and as far as I understood, my dear friend, he seemed to argue that it's it's mainly or, or almost exclusively mimetic at this point. Whereas I thought that you, you, you surely have it biologically imprinted when you're born and it's something that develops but then gets molded to such an extent by memes that it might not be that relevant anymore. Uh, so let me give an argument for why sex drive might be very, a very good niche for memes to uh, alter. So families and anything to do with, with kids and education are, I think, very important for memes. Like, if you have a meme that can cooperate with a meme about education, then that will keep itself entrenched very easily, just like memes that prevent uh, criticism do. Right. And sexuality, I think, is one of these niches that can be nicely exploited. So let's say that you have a meme that allows for people to be homosexual, then it could well be that those people, uh, certainly in uh, times gone by, had a hard time having children, and that people who uh, did have a partner of the opposite sex Yeah. Uh, had an easier time getting children and therefore memes that are associated to that expression, to that uh, sexual desire, had an easier time passing themselves on to the next generation. Because those memes can be part of the education system. Those memes will be passed on from their parents to their to the children. Uh, whereas the same would not be true for homosexuality, say. Which is not a case against homosexuality, I should add, but uh, it, it is to show that in the past there might have been selection pressure for memes to only allow uh, people to be interested in the opposite sex. And that it could even be that memes that suppressed homosexuality were part of that memeplex. So that because families were such a useful niche, Uh, any meme that went together with a meme that suppressed homosexuality in its host would be far more likely to be copied than memes that did not have this uh, cooperation. Right. But I mean, okay, so at some point, um, I mean, if we, I, I'm not sure how prevalent homosexuality is among other animals, but I know it's, it's something that occurs, but I, I think it's more rare. And uh, it is understandable in a, in a species without a creative mind and the, the usage of memes. So our predisposition still, still seems to propel us towards the opposite sex in, in, in terms of just getting to reproduce, right? Uh, well, initially it would. Yeah. There's no way in which that trait, which might be inborn, is then preserved until adulthood. Because... In people, lots of things happen between childhood and adulthood. Uh, it could be that even though they have this innate predisposition to be attracted to the opposite sex, they somehow, maybe because they you know, uh, watch television or something, uh, get interested in uh, people from the same sex. It's a, it's a very interesting alternate explanation for why we see a higher prevalence of Uh, heterosexuality that is not uh, simply explained by by our biology so all of this makes sense to me and i like the way of talking about it um, in the sense of universality and how memes can take over certain traits that have previously been dictated by genes uh, ad infinitum uh, i would suppose but so sensations are still affecting us clearly and certain moods and sensations seem to have a very strong uh, suggestive component to them like for instance yeah we talked about pain sure we can reinterpret that but 
if you're getting bit by a bee or something, it's it's a lot of extra work to somehow uh, reinterpret that and use the uh, it's all about ideas, it's all interpretational, like stop being worse about it or whatever. I I think what I'm trying to get it get at is we can't just push the pull of sensations aside either. So I would like to hear how you view that whole thing of, for instance, let's say. If you're a male and you have ever, uh, I don't know, accidentally swallowed an uh, estrogen pill that your wife is taking for some reason or influenced your hormonal levels to a significant degree, your sensational profile will will change rapidly and, and uh, remarkably and that will also make it much harder for you to ignore and and in some instances you might feel really really bad which will then influence your thinking and your problem solving so yeah how do you view that whole line between physiology and and psychology and how genes can still influence us in that sense yes well in that sense genes also influence the fact that we can think at all i mean the brain itself is a product of our genes and without those particular genes that have the blueprint for our brains in them we could not participate in problem solving at all. So genes do in fact have a very important role to play in constructing our bodies and also uh, our nervous system and everything. And uh, sensations are part of our physiology and are therefore, uh, or at least some sensations are part of our physiology, like uh, our ability to feel hot and cold, feel pain, I'm not sure where our emotions come from. I actually think you posted a, a, a tweet about this earlier today. Yes. And I don't know where they fit in. I don't know if they are part of our uh, physiology to some extent. I don't know if they're part of our m- mental capacity. But there is clearly this line between the more physiological responses and then the more mental ones. Right. Can you give a quick example of that? Well, so for example, the love that someone feels for uh, doing research is, I think, uh, a mental capacity. Like the, that fact that they can have fun doing something, uh, something that was not inborn, like uh, physics is not a trait, is not a uh, an activity that we have evolved genes for, for doing. Um, and yet we can enjoy it. And yet we have... Uh, it's it's purely because of our mental capacity that we can enjoy doing physics, and then on the other end there is uh, things like pain and touch sensations and things like that, and all of these are important for our problem solving. So, for example, if you uh, get stung by a bee, then you have learned something important and painful about uh, your current situation, which is that you've been injected with some venom, and yeah. I, I think what is important in that situation is uh, the fact that you have ideas about what happened to you which indicate that something bad is going on. So pain in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. As we said, you you could feel pain while you are exercising. In in this case, it's particularly that you have an explanation of what the pain is which determines that you are in a bad state. You are uh, injected with venom. But is it initially, though, don't you have somewhat of an automatic reaction at this, the very moment you're getting stung by the bee, which you can then interpret consciously and reinterpret? I th- well, I think that you get sensations, but you have to interpret them. Like of Saying otherwise is uh, proposing the bucket theory of mind, that you can learn something about the world without thinking about it. Yeah, surely there's unconscious... Uh, interpretation immediately. So even these sensations that you receive from being stung by a bee, say, will have to be interpreted by you. They they mean something. And usually they mean something bad. Like, for example, you want to use your arm, but now uh, you can't. And because of that, I think you are suffering. Yeah. So the pain in and of itself might mean anything. Or at the very least, the sensation of pain might mean anything. But in this particular situation, it is bad. And people deduce that it's bad. And that is why they are uh, they subsequently suffer. Yes. And I, 
I really think that the distinction between pain and suffering is an important one where, as you alluded to, you can have, you can be in pain without suffering and you can also be free of pain and still suffer, at least in the physical uh, sense. But yes. also we know that the brain at a certain level of pain, for instance, pain is a good example. So let's, let's stay with that. At a certain level of pain, your brain won't let you reinterpret that in a positive light. Or at least it won't let you think about anything else than said pain. Yes, I can, I can imagine that that's the case. So there might be other uh, versions of that that are similar to that that can inhibit our problem solving, wouldn't you say? Yes. Well, I guess there are situations in which we have problems that you don't want to have. And this is just another one of those cases, just like being stung by bees. So, you, yeah, there are cases where you get knocked out, say, because of the pain. Then once you're knocked out, knocked out, you can't do anything anymore. But the reason it is bad is because that is not a problem you want to have. If you were really looking forward to being knocked out and learning something from the experience, which, I mean, I can imagine people being crazy enough to actually want that to happen. Uh, people have done stranger things within the history of science. And if you want to discover something about being knocked out, about maybe even fainting from having, uh, from experiencing too much pain, then unless there are unforeseen consequences, it could be that that experience is actually not a bad one for you. Other people might really dislike it, and yet to you it is something interesting which is why you, you sought out the experience. There's something extremely encouraging about this whole idea that we, we have such tremendous power of mind to reinterpret whatever we face. And um, it's not just the cheesy self-help slogan, but it actually stems from our best explanations of how things work and how the mind works. So I, I have another question here regarding meme theory. I'm not I'm not entirely sure who originated this way of talking about it, but I think it was either Susan Blackmore or maybe it was Dawkins as well. But talking about memes as viruses, how do you view that? Um, I mean, it sounds about correct to the extent that it is a it's kind of a vague analogy. But if they mean something very specific, like memes do not carry information like cells do and are therefore like viruses then i don't i don't have an opinion on that it, it sounds like it is just a, a metaphor that people use to explain uh, what memes are and to some extent i agree with the metaphor but to the extent that it is being specific about something i i don't know what it means i think it has more to do with the fact that because i i think i um i'm remembering now that dawkins is using it to describe things like religion for instance, something that replicates that isn't actually in our best interest or an idea that isn't rational. Ah, I see. And it's, it's a virus in the way of uh, having kind of an intention of uh, getting itself replicated in a malicious sense, I think. Yes, uh, I see what you mean now. Well, for one thing, I don't think they have intentions. I mean, I don't think you think this either, but it's an important fact to keep in mind. They yeah. don't know what they're doing and we should be careful because uh, sometimes by accident we explain them as though memes do have intention. Um, but yes, it is very true that memes can copy themselves at our expense. For example, there are religious religious doctrines which are irrational and uh, like, say, that you buy... Oh, I forget the expression. I think it's something like if you uh, spare the cane then you spoil the child, which is a religious doctrine which says that you should punish your children, otherwise you neglect them, or you, you are, in fact, harming them in another way. Yeah, makes total sense. I think this doctrine is irrational and, and copies itself, at, in this case, the expense of children, and, 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 and doesn't actually benefit anyone. The morality that's implied by it is wrong. And yet, for probably most of human history... People did punish children, not in this very specific way with the intent of doing it for Christianity, but 
to instill ideas in them that then they would enact later in life because of the way that they've been harmed, that they've been traumatized. Hmm. So it might not always make sense to merely speak about memes as tools that we use, but we can also be used by them in more in the sense of, of how a virus use our bodies to, to replicate. Or Yes. Yes, in that sense, the meme and virus analogy is... is very nice and exact i think do you have any thoughts on how to deal with anti-rational memes um or or get out of of bad thought loops or anything like that because i've talked about how those things work to some extent with previous guests but i haven't really got into any prescriptive things do you have any suggestions there or i don't really know i think that Feeling bad is bad, <laughs> and, and you should try to, to make sure that you get to feel better as soon as possible, and then maybe you can think more rationally about the situation that you are in. Right. So basically never make... So it's kind of a version of don't shop when you're hungry, but <laughs> don't make decisions when you feel bad. Yes, kind of. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that I am very good at giving out live advice, but uh, I, I think <laughs> this is a, a thing that might be useful and then from that vantage point you can assess whatever happened to you and then you should of course be critical trying to find solutions and also it's it, it's helpful to keep in mind that the solutions are actually available that you do not need to suffer endlessly you you can uh, solve a bad situation which is usually not assumed by people and is in fact part of what keeps bad situations from being resolved. Yeah, and this reminds me of a great quote by a great experimental psychologist called Eugene Gendlin. Uh, I think you pronounce it. He created a therapy called focusing. And the quote is, nothing bad is ever the last step. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's really great to keep in mind. That if something feelings if something is feeling bad, then there's an unsolved problem there that could be solved, and you don't have to feel bad anymore. Yes, which is uh, very nice. Yes, it's a great improvement to begin with. Yeah. Okay, this sounds very similar to David Deutsch's idea of the fun criterion and how to always try to judge whether something is fun or not uh, as a way of not getting stuck in these irrational thought loops and things like that, but but what to do then uh, with the caveat in mind that you haven't thought very much about this, but what would you say is a good path of action if you can't find a way to, to do something fun, if you're, you don't even know what you think is fun, which would be the case for certain people who are depressed or... Um, well, that, that seems to me to be the first thing to try and find out. You have to have a guess about what you're going to do next. And you should try to find the most fun one. Uh, but we, we can't determine for people in general what that is. Uh, and if they don't know what it will be for them, then uh, no one else will either. And they should themselves figure out what it is that they, say, most enjoy doing or most want to do in that moment. Yeah, I mean, you can see that this if you're stuck in that particular way, in the way that you cannot figure out what would relieve your suffering even right then, then uh, you'll be in a very bad way. And I don't know how to get out of that. I, I suppose that this is why therapy is, is very useful to people. Yeah. No, I think I, I think you're right that it's... It's not something that's very well known, how to get out of these bad hang-ups and thought loops and, and meta loops and things like that. And um, hopefully we have people like Luli working on it for us yes. so we don't have to do that work. All right, Sam, I think it's time to answer some questions from Twitter here. I hope you're ready. Yeah, bring it on. So let's start with... James Smith at the Thinker Smith. He says, Sam, I appreciate your critical rationalist physics interpretations and ideas. Though you might recall me pointing out the anthropos oh, this is a hard one, huh? Anthropocentricity of some of your arguments. 
I'd like to know your reaction to this and how you consider life forms apart from humans in your worldview. Oh, it's a difficult one. I don't. I don't think I remember what uh, my anthropocenticity. I can't. I can't say it. I'm. I'm relieved that you couldn't either. Yes, that makes me happy. I, I don't know what the anthropocentism of my view is. My guess is that he means that I think people are fundamentally important to uh, the way the universe operates. Then, how dare you? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I think he has that response. And if that's what he means, then my answer would be, uh, I think other animals just simply don't have the capacity to explain. So, for example, they will not have free will in the sense that we explained earlier in the podcast. And anything else that is a person but is not a human being will have exactly those traits that we explained, which traits like an ability to explain how the world works, uh, free will... Uh, morality, all, all of the fundamental things that we have. And, and that's how we would have to explain those other non-human beings that are nonetheless people. They're, they would be equally fundamental. I'm wondering if he's just wanting to know if you're a cat or a dog person. <laughs> uh, I'm a dog person. Dogs are amazing. I have to concur. Okay, so this is a question that I like, and it is from Luli at Recent is Fun, and she says, what got you interested in CR? What problems did it initially solve for you? I think initially it just solved the question of, of why we know things. So um, I was probably, though unaware, a kind of Bayesian or uh, some kind of inductivist where I believe that experiments gave validity to our claim that we know that something is true for a fact. And one of the things that was nice about critical rationalism was that it immediately solved that problem for me because I, for a long time, realized that this was not very satisfactory. Several people uh, had pointed it out to me. I, I initially thought it was uh, something like Bayesianism was a completely fine approach to uh, have towards science. And uh, for a long time, I just I just thought that this was one of those issues that did not have a nice solution, that it, there no nice solution would be accessible to us in principle. So when I first learned about about proper solution to uh, the problem of induction, I, I was just very relieved that uh, I was wrong about that. And then secondly, it also allowed me to accept scientific realism. Well, that's actually the wrong way of putting it. I, th I think I was a some, something that they call uh, a scientific realist, which is a person that takes seriously scientific explanations as being about the real world. They, they are not simply models uh, that are useful. They actually are objectively true. I, I was a proponent of this. I, I thought that scientific theories were indeed objectively true, but I had no good arguments for why that was the case. I thought it was just a thing that one has to naively think is true to make progress in science. And then because of that, I, I also took seriously the, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is now uh, what my research at university is about, at least partly. So many things fell into place for me because of my interests in science and physics particularly. And the solution to those issues was very nice. It was, it was a great kind of stepping stone for me in my intellectual kind of history, I guess. And how long ago would you say this was? Um, I think it is now probably three and a half years or something. It's probably been three, four years since I uh, was convinced that Popper had solved the problem of induction. Mm. So I, I thought we could end on... A third question here from Tom Hyde at Tom underscore illusion. I don't know if he's a ghost or a bot or I don't know what he means by that, but that's cool. <laughs> um, he asks his, I, I assume that's you, his PhD experience, how it stacks up to regular education in terms of teaching coercion and autonomy. Not a question, but all right. Yes, well, we can make it a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I like Tom. I just want to shout out to Tom. He's cool. Yeah, I think we both like Tom. Yeah, I, I, my PhD experience so far has been very nice. It's uh, I have a fair amount of freedom, and I want to hear the answer. But I just got a really fun image of when you said that I have a fair amount of freedom. I just saw you sitting in that room now with your advisor next to you, the whole conversation, <laughs> just nodding or turning his head if you can't say or say something. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, How do you know? No, You're allowed nodding. to know no, this. No, no, no. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Stop, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sorry. Please continue. Uh, my PG experience has been very nice so far. I have uh, quite a bit of freedom. And what I think, what I appreciate most is that within my particular research group, there is a tradition of taking seriously other researchers. We are treated as colleagues, not as students. This is... I think both nice and important to have within a research group. Like you want to appreciate uh, the work other people do. And also I think that researchers are just more effective and efficient at doing research and also having more fun if they are actually interested in the topics that they pick. And yeah, yeah, this is something that is taken for granted in our group that we get to pick our own topics, that we get to work at our own pace. And it's very nice. It's, it's, how I think all research groups should work. How does it compare to to your college experience or even high school? It's kind of insane to think back about my undergraduate and high school. It, a lot of things that I learned in, in undergraduate and during high school, uh, I now no longer use on a regular basis or, no, or even at all. Yes. And the nice thing about doing research is that you especially research where you are free to actually engage with the topics that you find interesting, is that you engage with problems that you genuinely have. You you have misunderstandings about, in my case, I have misunderstandings of quantum physics. Uh, there's something I do not know how to do, do not know how to explain, and I get to try to find solutions to those problems. Whereas in undergraduate, you are constantly presented things that you should find interesting and if you don't, then yeah. too bad. You have to learn it anyway. And you, you start. I, I started to think that this is how the real world worked. That you, you know, that exams are somehow uh, a real thing that you would have to keep doing in some way or another, even when you had a job that uh, you would keep learning in that particular way, where you, you know, you're cramming for an exam and you are worried that you don't know. Uh, the complete syllabus or you don't know it by heart or something whereas in the real world you have problems that you were interested in and then tried to solve and that is how you engage with the subject matter and and you also learn uh, by the way that's not always how it works but that is how it should work in the best case but uh, yeah. what is always the case I think is that you learn what isn't isn't useful in practice by having, by really engaging with the subjects. So it might be that you have a programming job and people told you that several things were useful in your undergraduate where you learned how to program. And then in the real world, you find out what actually is and isn't useful to your particular problem situation, which is always highly parochial. It's always very specific and people can never completely prepare you for it. And often they do a very bad job at preparing you for it and make you learn many things that are completely unnecessary, like uh, at the very least happened to me during high school and undergraduate. Yeah, no, I, I'm just coming off two home exams that I've written over Christmas that were purely, I have to do these cramming, like you said, and just, yeah, it's not, uh, it can be fairly traumatic, actually, to have to do that over and over. And now I'm, I'm trying to think back to, the amount of years you spend in an environment like that where you're supposed to just sit there with your hands on your knees and just enjoy the fact that that you you give kids diagnoses like hda or what's it called adhd just because they don't want to sit still and listen to a boring fucking subject that they don't care about yeah uh that that's a disorder is mind baffling so i um i'm glad to hear that the phd experience is better for you yes. and even uh, enjoyable. Yeah, I, That's great. I, I'm reminded of a an experience I had going to undergraduate. So I, I from high school, I went to call it to university. And the experience was that I asked one of the 
math lectures about whether or not we we're going to treat this thing that I uh, had learned in high school because it, you know, we were one year into our coursework and I was very curious whether or not we were going to actually talk about it because in high school uh, they made a big deal out of it. And the lecturer kind of looked at me almost with confusion and said, no, we won't be covering that at all. And it's just this experience of really being convinced that this was an important piece of mathematics for my career in physics, and then realizing that it's, it, it almost was like a hoax, like someone made me learn this, not because it had practical implications, but because that was the thing that you had to learn to you know, get into university. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of high school is like that, where you think that, well, at least if you think that the things you learn in high school are used in practice, then uh, you'll be wrong a fair amount of the time. That is, usually that's not the case. Usually you learn things because that is the way that school is set up. There's things that people think you should learn, but there's not necessarily a connection with the real world. Yeah, which is uh, quite a silly way to go about things, but I don't have a great solution myself on how to organize it otherwise. And maybe that's a, a topic for another day, but... Yeah, man, I want to I wanna thank you for coming on and, and talking to me. This has been great fun. Cool. Yeah, same. I hope I can get you back. You certainly can. All right, now I have it on tape. And uh, fuck your advisor who's sitting there shaking his head. But uh, have a good night. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk to you soon. My yeah, friend. you too. All right, stay cool. Yeah.